So my name is Melody Updike Tucker, and I work at the Greenville Zoo. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Raw Safari Podcast. Y'all, this is one of those episodes that I know y'all can't wait to get more of, which is another episode that delves into red pandas at a zoo. Don't worry, though, we talk about a lot of other animals, too, and some other cool stuff. But, um, yeah, this is this is one of those Fanda episodes, not gonna lie. Uh, it's our second episode in a row at the Greenville Zoo, and you're going to get to hear a really different take on the zoo than you heard last week from Maxine. So I'm excited to share all of that with you. But um, first, I want to remind you all to uh, make sure that you hit subscribe so you don't miss any episodes, and also make sure that you are following along at Ross Safari on Instagram, Facebook, kind of on Twitter-ish, I guess, although I don't really do much on there, and at Raw Safari Pod on the TikTok machine. Uh, and of course, you can also support the pod for as little as $3 a month by going to patreon.com slash Raw Safari. As a matter of fact, we have a brand new patron that we are adding to the family. Welcome, Mary Blair. I'm so grateful to have you as a patron. Thank you for being here. And I hope that you are already going back and listening to all of the amazing bonus audio that you get from some episodes of the podcast. Thank you so much for your support, Mary, and all of my patrons. I really appreciate y'all. You really keep this ship running. Yeah, and that's really all I have to say before we get to it, because I know y'all are waiting to hear about pandas and, like, other animals and stuff. So uh, let's do it. Without further ado, here is my interview with Melody Updike Tucker of the Greenville Zoo. I did not start out as a zookeeper, which I think is um, really wonderful for people that are interested in having a second career or are interested in the path of zookeeping and or taking care of animals in some form or fashion. Um, I started out as an interior designer. Okay. A long time ago. Uh, another world, another life. Um, but yeah, so I always had a passion for animals. Um, and I, as a child, uh, found myself playing with, you know, toy animals, stuffed animals, things like that, plushies, um, and would go to zoos with my family. Um, I have a pretty diverse background. My dad grew up um, in a different country. And so I think that that really helped me a lot to have um, a passion for different cultures and to learn about different types of animals um, within those cultures. So um, that was one of the experiences that I had as a, as a young child um, and kind of grew up really interested and wanted to be a marine biologist, actually. And so that was uh, sort of the passion from probably the age of six until I went to high school and got done. Um, and just decided to go off road and become an interior designer. So that didn't really make a lot of sense. It's like a 180. Um, and I, I learned a lot from that process, but I was, I didn't feel like I was giving to the environment. I didn't feel like it was just, you know, a place for my soul to be, um, sort of a passion, if you will. So I ended up, um, leaving, um, the interior design world and I got into just, you know, dog grooming, getting into some smaller jobs like a pet smart and things like that. Um, that kind of reset me into that mind state where I was younger and had the opportunity to to love animals and want to work with them. And um, so that kind of led me to um, going to school for zookeeping and zoo science technology um, and was able to get a degree with that and then come to work at the zoos. Nice. Very cool. Um, it, when you first... <laughs> I'm such an idiot. When you first said that you were uh, you do, doing interior design, um, my, my first thought was, let me guess, you saw some like bamboo decorations and were like, wait a minute, red pandas. But uh, <laughs> apparently that's not what happened. But that's where my brain went. So. Yeah, I don't know. A little bit of feng shui <laughs> can, can go a long way. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this, this will either be a silly question or a serious one, but I mean it to be serious. But um, do you find that your knowledge and experience with interior design um, helps you when it comes to like – arranging stuff in an exhibit and like, you know, 
decorating, for lack of a better word, uh, <laughs> an exhibit. I do. Um, that's one of the things that uh, I have I have come to realize where I kind of mesh both worlds together. Um, sometimes I will be in an exhibit and I will literally say in my head, why did they put this here? This is so, this is dumb. Um, but uh, sometimes, you know, it's an opportunity for me to realize, hey, let's create something that is both um, good for the keeper and the animal. Um, we want to make sure that the animal is at the forefront of that, but um, making sure that the keeping staff is able to um, work this functionally and, and be able to help the animal manage the animal better in, in the zoo care. That's really cool. I, I love how so many times, like, I think when you have a different um, history, be it the arts or be it, you know, whatever, um, and then you come to keeping, I think there's a whole world that it opens up and like the ability to like bring that experience is really cool. Definitely. Um, I've seen that through other people too. You know, I'm not the first case of this. And anytime that, you know, um, somebody has an, a background in something that can really help um, the zoo field to see it from a different perspective, a different aperture, if you will. And so that, that can really make a difference for the care of the animals. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, how long have you been at Greenville? Um, I have been working here since 2017, but I've actually been employed since 2019. So I did some internships beforehand here, um, and then I, I left for a little bit and then came back. Um, so um, internships that turned into, at some point, some part-time work, which turned into some temp temporary full-time position, which turned into a full-time position, so... Nice. That's, I feel like that's, that's the challenge for so many keepers is just having to go through periods like that where it's, it's feast or famine. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The dog grooming came in handy at that point. Cause it was definitely something I was like, I, I'm going to have to <laughs> find another source of income <laughs> yeah, <laughs> along yeah. with this. That, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm still, I, you know, I, I think I, I get it to a point, but I think, um, and I actually know, uh, for the record that Greenville actually takes pretty good care of their keepers, um, compared to a lot of zoos. They which do. Is, which is Yes. really cool. I'm very fortunate. Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful thing. But I, I think in general, the fact that um, so many times, so many times I will do an interview with somebody and hit it off and just get along super well. And we spend the day walking around, talking to animals and do an interview. And I'll be like, yo, let's like grab dinner or something before I leave town. And they're like, oh, no, wait, I have to go work at Wendy's. And I'm like, <laughs> ah, it just it breaks my heart because it should not it should not be that way. But I do love that Greenville takes good care of their keepers. I yeah. think that's important. Um, yeah. So uh, let's uh, let's tell everybody what section you work in. So I'm the primary keeper of our Asia section. Ooh, you know what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I get the most wonderful pleasure of working with our uh, three Sumatran orangutans, our two Amar leopards, our four Siamian gibbons, our two red pandas, uh, <laughs> and our one Eurasian eagle owl in a pear tree. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about some of the animals that you take care of, and we're going to start with the one that everyone is expecting me to want to talk about, which is the uh, Eurasian eagle owl. Okay. It's not, but that's what we're oh, going to okay. start with because uh, <laughs> I, I like I'll to- Oh, you took me by surprise. I know. I know. I like to keep my pandas. I like to keep- I have a lot of pandas who listen to the podcast, oh, cool. and so as such, I feel the need to um, tease them, torture yeah. them. I don't call, call uh, them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Reel them along. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just need to make sure that they hear the other stuff because yeah. like zoos do more cool stuff than just red pandas or so I'm told. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so let's, let's talk about this owl. That's so exciting. Yeah, so we um, have a Eurasian eagle owl. She's a female. And we actually received her from another facility. Uh, we were uh, had an older exhibit that actually had a red panda in it. Uh, her name was Scarlett. Um, but uh, when Scarlett passed away, um, kind of a little bit, she was older, but it was kind of a little bit sudden for us for, you know, we knew that it was coming, but we're hopeful that it would last, that she would last a little longer than right. she did. And but that kind of sometimes happens. Um, so um, Scarlett had passed on and uh, it was an older exhibit. So it was an opportunity for us to renovate it. Um, interior design coming through. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it was really great for us to have that opportunity because uh, it allowed us to bring in another animal into that section. We had not had birds in a while. So a long time ago, there were some hornbills. Um, but since then, the, the hornbills, I believe, and I was not here for this process, but I believe they moved to another facility. And then um, we ended up having the red panda there, obviously. And then and then we moved that into a Eurasian eagle owl exhibit. So um, her name's Matilda. Nice. I call her Matilda Hoots. <laughs> Miss Hoots. Um, <laughs> sometimes uh, we've heard uh, in the past, uh, she's been named Inga for Inga Hoots. 
okay. in, in, in cahoots. She's in cahoots. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of... good pun. <laughs> the only thing better than a good pun is a bad pun, which in this case, that was kind of a bad pun. So I like it. Like it. <laughs> kind of works. Um, but yeah, I really liked the name Matilda, so I kind of you know moved that on. Nice. Um, so yes, we have Matilda Hoots in our uh, Eurasian Eagle exhibit up in Asia. Do you have any specific questions about Miss Matilda? I do. Tell me everything. Uh, no, in particular, um, is, talk, talk, to, talk to me about like personality. So um, Matilda's a little more standoffish. In the fight or flight scene, she's going to fly. Um, so that's kind of owls in general. Mm-hmm. Um, she is the largest owl in the world. Um, she has like Bojangles cup colored eyes. Have you ever been to Bojangles? I have, yeah, yeah. She has these amazing colored eyes, and um, <laughs> they are, I don't know, I would say tantalizing. Um, so it's its really a cool experience. Um, owls don't want to be seen, so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, I'll look um, beside her instead of right at her. That way she doesn't see me focusing right in on her, but... Um, Maybe, you know, she's a tree or maybe she's a a rock and I'm not actually able to see her. So it's a great way for her to blend into her environment. Um, And that kind of, you know, segues into, you know, the part of that is, is that um, she has amazing camouflage um, and that's going to be very helpful for her and likewise her species to be able to hide um, in the daytime up in the trees, which would be natural for them. Nice. Is she a diva? I wouldn't say she's a diva. Okay. Okay. So this is just this is just Maxine's then because so so last week we we talked to Maxine from the zoo mm-hmm. and uh she she was telling me how all of the eagles that she deals with are divas. Oh. So I think maybe Maxine's the problem here. I think she's just <laughs> teaching her diva behavior. You don't come across as much of a diva yourself. So yeah. <laughs> I, t- I try to be more salt of the earth. I don't know. I might be. <laughs> People might argue with me. Maxine might, I know Maxine and she might say that I'm a diva. <laughs> so she shook her head. <laughs> she's here today. Yes. Don't worry. I'm not actually harassing somebody who's not here. I'm just picking on a friend <laughs> who is here, everybody. But um, no, that's, that's very cool. I, um, I have had the pleasure of having a Eurasian eagle owl on a glove on my arm and it wow. was one of the craziest experiences of my life. That's um, amazing. Yeah, I was at the the National Aviary and they were like, well, have you meet a bird? And I was like, cool. And I figured, you know, it's going to be a one of the birds that we meet all the time, you know, yeah. a citizen or something like that. And um, they brought out a Eurasian eagle owl and I pooped my pants a little bit in excitement. It That's incredible. So yeah, it was yeah. very cool. We've so. never really done that, um, had the opportunity to do that with uh, Matilda. Um, that's something that I would love to work towards. Um, she's not at the point where we can do that with her mm-hmm. just quite yet. She's still a little bit nervous, um, but I've been working just about every other day, um, just being closer to her on exhibit, as well as, you know, putting up an arm with a, actually it's a welding glove, Nice, but and it's not, you know, meant for her to actually, you know, get on, but it is meant for her to see that that color and that size. And then it's not, you know, just a random arm just being near to her for her safety and mine, right, right. Um, but allowing her to see that, you know, sort of learning about that glove and then being in being okay. So it's kind of like counter conditioning what we're doing with her. And that is like, she actually gets the reward by me leaving her. She's uncomfortable with me being up close to her. So, um, by me being there and her being calm and then me walking away, that's the reward. Yeah. That's interesting. That's very cool. How is, how is the training going? How do you feel about it? How, how does Matilda seem to be doing? Um, she's doing better when we first started working with her, um, that we noticed that, um, she would fly away. And I can even say like, um, the keeper that I work, um, in partnership with, um, when she first started training in the area, uh, she would go in and Matilda would fly away, um, from the, she has a muse box that she's a big fan of. And, um, she would fly from the muse to another prop, um, just away from the entrance of the enclosure. Um, and so we would see that behavior when I started working with her to begin with. And then when, um, my other keeper, uh, Madison started working in the area, um, she, we, we noticed that behavior as well. At this point, um, I, she can be in the muse and I can be, you know, just far away as you and I are, you know, within just a couple of feet from her and have that welding glove right near her. And she's fine. Um, now she's not in love with the idea of it. Right, uh, right. We do see some behavior in her, her eyes widen. She's sometimes she'll, you know, um, make some clicking noises, um, or 
you know, look like she's about to sort of fly off. Um, but typically speaking, she has, she will allow me to do that without doing that behavior of flying off. So that's, that's awesome. Something towards working towards. Yay. Training wins. Yeah. And, uh, what is the, what is the point of doing this? I mean, obviously we're talking, uh, an exhibit animal, not a, um, ambassador, not going to be hanging out on my arm on a glove next time I come and visit probably. Yeah. So why, why are you doing this? How does that help Matilda, you know, enrich her life? So the ultimate goal would be just to be able to get hands on this animal. Um, this isn't something that we, like you said, we would use for an ambassador situation, but instead of having to go in and net her up, um, anytime we have to do an exam on her, um, just to be able to get her, you know, in a glove or to get her comfortable with the concept of that, um, would be ideal for us to be able to help with her welfare and her care. That makes sense. And uh, yeah, that's very cool. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll get to the other pandas, but you actually mentioned Scarlet and I don't want this to flit out of my brain. Okay. Um, but um, I know that Scarlet was like a really beloved animal here. Scarlet was, yes. And the way that I know this is that I visited here for the first time. The day after Scarlet passed. Did and you really? I did. And it was not intentional. I did not mm-hmm. know that or anything. I just, I happened to be here. And um, there were the two exhibits. Mm-hmm. And I, I saw the pandas in the other exhibit. And I asked the keeper. I was like, oh, where's, where's the other panda? You know, off exhibit or whatever. And, um, you know, they told me very calmly. And But you could tell it was it was such an upset thing. Yeah. And the, the person I spoke to was... Um, singing the praises of Scarlet. I wish I, I wish I had it yeah. recorded, honestly, yeah. um, just from the perspective of, you know, for anybody in the, and I, I know nobody from this world would listen to this podcast, but, but from, for, you know, people in the anti-captivity world who are saying, oh, these people are just in it for money. First of all, ha ha ha. We, we all know nobody's making enough money to be that. But, but second <laughs> of all, like it would have been, it, it was such an amazingly passionate speech about, um, about this incredible animal and about how loved Scarlet was. Yeah. So would you be willing to talk about Scarlet a little bit and share just a little bit? Sure. Um, I didn't get to work with Scarlet as long as um, the other keepers did. Um, I was kind of new when I came on to that process. Um, but I did get to work with her and she she was a very, very good um, red panda. It's something that both the keepers loved and the, you know, the public loved. The guests really loved her a lot. They knew her. So um, as you were saying, you know, you met her and you remember her. So, um, so yeah, um, it was, she was on the older end of being a red panda. I think she was 14, I want to say. Yeah, that's a great age. So when she passed, she did have some balding issues. Um, but, you know, you think about, you know, people say you shouldn't anthropomorphize animals. I like to call it zoopomorphizing where we compare like humans to animals instead. <laughs> but it's totally an opportunity for me to sort of allow people to build that connection with an animal. So um, that's something that I, I kind of like to do. Um, but just like, you know, um, an older lady might lose her hair and you know, or somebody who had um, a declining health might lose their hair. Um, she kind of had a little bit of that issue with her tail. And we would notice, you know, we would come in and see little floofs and, you know, her hair was starting to come um, lose some of that hair. And and that's normal. We would see that. We had really, really good care for her. Um, she had a sort of a maze um, and we did it more in her exhibit. Um, and the way we did this was uh, putting up, um, I want to say two by sixes. Uh, along the way. So they weren't even two by six. They were. Here's that interior designer showing up again. I know. (laughs) It doesn't matter. Uh, Planks. We had planks. planks. (laughs) We had planks that were um, going up on the exhibit and they started out the ground and they were at a very low, just like you would with a wheelchair, um, you know, very low and um, uh, blocked up so that she could get up on them and then she could move around the exhibit because we didn't want her to I mean this, this isn't more arboreal animals so I mean they do spend some time on the ground but not a lot of time and for a panda that wouldn't you know be able to get up or jump up on props just to due to the age we wanted to make it as, as um, convenient for her as possible to have that natural behavior so they had those planks up and um going through the exhibit in different places. Um, and then we had lots of hammocks um, within the exhibit so that she could take lots of naps throughout the day. She did rest a little bit more than a more active panda would. Um, and then we would offer her different types of treats and things like that to help her with any sort of medication taking that she might have had. Uh, raisins, for instance. Nice, Sometimes so she nice. would enjoy some raisins. Um, so craisins too, so occasionally. I'm a big craisin fan myself. So um, are all geriatric pandas that I've met. 
I feel yeah. like as they get older, I don't know if it's just due to like, you know, taste buds eroding or whatever as you get older or whatever, mm. but craisins become like a thing with geriatric pandas. Yeah, man, you want to you wanna make sure that they get their medication. You just mm-hmm. offer them some of that. Yeah. Bananas work really well with some of our younger ones. Mm-hmm. Like Asa is a huge fan for anybody listening that knows Asa. Um, yeah, those are – that's a amazing – treat for her but yes uh definitely miss scarlet was was enjoying craisins for sure nice well thanks for sharing a little bit about about scarlet because i just i think it's so cool that you know even though she's gone she's so well remembered and people love her and like i i have such a a a full memory of of speaking to that keeper the day after and just being like I, I, you are such a beautiful soul. Like I can tell yeah. how much Scarlet meant to you. It's just, it's a beautiful thing, you know, mm-hmm. it really is. Um, but let's talk about, you know, living animals. Um, so uh, <laughs> you you have some orangutans here. We do. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued by orangutans. I think they're very cool animals. Um, I recently had two very different people on the podcast talking about orangutans a little bit. So I had Leif Cox, who does a lot of um, wild uh, support of orangutans and conservation work. Um, And then I had somebody representing the roundtable on sustainable palm oil. Oh, wow. Um, And they disagreed on everything. Really? It's fascinating. I highly recommend you go and check out those two episodes. I will, some time. for sure. <laughs> um, but Leif's attitude is that palm oil isn't an issue. And um, I mean, I'm oversimplifying. You can listen to the episode. But and obviously the uh, RSPO thinks it is. And, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, his take is that we should be like cuddling orangutans and then putting them back out in the wild and stuff. And he's done that and there's been some success. And yeah. obviously that is not the strategy in zoos. Yeah. Um, so I just I have become fascinated with this this amazing animal because they're already so cool but then to see like such different takes on them and both very passionately believed and both supported with studies and with actual work done with them i just find them fascinating so so tell me about your orangs so um we have three um orangutans that are here we have male kumar um he is 17 we have our female lana who is 37, and then we have their offspring, Adira, who will be turning five in August, on August 7th. So um, our male Kumar, I came in at a very, um, very hard time for him. Um, He was just starting to flange out, and um, he was really exploring his world. Can you imagine like a 17 year old who gets his license and gets a Ferrari at the same time? (laughs) So he was just like, you know, really on the go all the time, um, trying things out, exploring things. And so that was a challenge both for the keepers that were working in the area at the time, because I was, you know, the secondary backup keeper, um, as well as me learning about different, you know, types of personalities. I had worked with chimpanzees before that, but I had not had the opportunity to work with orangutans. And, um, Orangutans um, may not have the rambunctious behavior that you might see from chimpanzees, but they have the cognition behavior that you see. Um, And they are very, very intelligent and um, they need a lot of enrichment to keep them occupied. So that was always a challenge. Like, what are we going to give Kumar today? (laughs) (laughs) But um, yeah, he's he's wonderful. I really enjoy working with him. Um, He's mellowed out a lot um, now. He's gotten older. um, So that does help. Um, with sort of managing his care and and what we need to provide for him and making sure that he is um, cognitively enriched. Yeah, that's a great point. How do you keep uh, orangutans cognitively enriched? Um, Because they are so intelligent, we want to be able to provide them with all kinds of different um, options for enrichment. And that doesn't necessarily just mean physical. Um, That can mean, you know, sensory or that can mean like olfactory. So um, we'll use different types of things like that. We have some larger enrichment items um, because they can be so strong. Um, So we've got like 55 gallon drums or like stock tanks that we use. Um, We've also um, given them some things that kind of make them sort of cognitively think we have some time feeders and things of that nature which allow them to have to wait for um, enrichment to to come out, food enrichment for them to come out. Um, we can also sometimes give them, you know, different types of food. So throughout the season, um, if pineapples are in season, we can give them some pineapples or mangoes. Um, that's not part of their everyday diet, but it is something that they still like a lot. Uh, we also have things like lavender and, and rose petal, um, things that we might 
move in or, or um, mix with their wood wool, cinnamon, things of that nature as well. Um, our female likes bubbles a lot. Nice. Lana, so um, sometimes we'll even do like a bubble bath. Oh, um, that's so, so cool. Give them an opportunity to, to play and explore the world. I like that. And I'm curious when you're trying to figure out, because like you said, orangutans are really strong. And so yeah. when you're trying to figure out enrichment items for uh, orangutans, do you, like how do you get them? Do you just go to orangutantoy.com? Is there, you know, an Amazon for, for zoos or how, how do you create these things or get them or how does that work? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, we actually, there are some um, places that offer enrichment for different types of species or megafauna. Um, Wildlife Toy Box is one of those. Um, their items can sometimes be a little bit expensive, but they're definitely really, really durable. The things that we've had that have lasted the longest are are from Wildlife Toy Box um, or similar companies of that nature. Uh, we have an Amazon wish list, uh, which we you know promote with the, within the zoo. Um, and that can be found like on the Greenville Zoo's foundation website. Um, and those things are um, particularly things that keepers, um, myself included, have put things on that we're requesting. Um, things that the zoo is kind of interested in purchasing at some point, but if somebody gets to it before them, that's always a win-win. <laughs> so That makes a lot of sense. That's very cool. I, uh, I dig that. Um, I know that from my experience with orangutans, um, blankets are a big thing too. They like to like hide. Oh, yeah. Do y'all do, do that here? We do. We have some Jedi warriors. Oh, okay. Nice. Sure. Nice. Very cool. So, um, yeah, our uh, male, female, and um, our juvenile have all um, played with, with blankets. We have sheets in particular. Um, we don't give them fitted sheets. They can't have the fitted sheets, but they can have um, regular sheets. Not that it matters, interior design. Um, but <laughs> I, I literally was like, where are you going with this? All right. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's just because um, sometimes those fitted sheets can have that uh, material in it, which is causing it to have that stretch, and they're not allowed to have that. Gotcha. Um, now, we don't allow our orangutans to have sheets on exhibit um, just because they can get it twisted through the mesh and they can use that as a, like a saw oh. and we don't <laughs> want that behavior um so <laughs> they do get them in the dens and they get them every night and they should have um different forms of bedding and that is one of the things that we can give them that that can provide bedding as well as any sort of boxes that they may would like to use or that we can put in there um we often will sometimes try to either order boxes or sometimes we can get some from the produce um from our commissary um to to engage them with and then we give them wood wool as well. So different nice. forms of bedding. So just so I'm clear, they can't have them on exhibit, but the orangutans here do have blankies when they go to bed. They do. I like that. I like <laughs> that a lot. Uh, very cool. So, um, yeah, that's uh, – I don't know why, but whenever anybody says the word orangutan to me, um, I picture them doing the Jedi thing. I don't know why, but that is like the burned image in my brain. They totally do that. Though They will put them over their head. Um, it can be used as sort of, a, I guess, a comfort behavior, um, but it's also like a hiding behavior. So our juvenile will sometimes do that to hide. So it, it's kind of cute. She will um, play. It, it's not quite peekaboo. Um and that's kind of anthropomorphic to say that, but I will notice that she'll stick her head up and look at me and then put the sheet back down and then stick her head up to look at me and then put the sheet back down. So when she does do that, I'll say, oh, I got you or peekaboo to her <laughs> to sort of play with. You know, her. I, I have a complicated relationship with the word anthropomorphize uh, in part because it's hard to say, and I'm a podcaster who has to say it a lot, yeah. but also just because I think... I do think there is a problem with some of it. And I think you can get to a real issue with like, oh, look, the monkey is smiling at me. I'm going to smile back at it. Like there, yeah. there are issues. Yeah. But I also think that as you get to know animal personalities and animal behaviors. It's very difficult. <laughs> well, it's not even that it's difficult. It's that sometimes you're right. Like that behavior that you are seeing that juvenile doing, you're right that, you know, she would not know the term peekaboo but she, she is she's hiding and playing and that's literally mm -hmm. the same thing that peekaboo is like yeah it's not like she's doing it because she's afraid of you it's not like she's doing it because it's a behavior they do in the wild because there are not many sheep trees where orangutans live um and so i do th i do think it's kind of fair to say that or to say like you know um i mean you know i i have this this video that's wildly viral where i was playing drums with an elephant 
Um, and the elephant wanted to play the drums. And and that was a behavior that it learned well before it was ever at this zoo or anything. But I, I've had a couple of people say to me like, well, aren't you anthropomorphizing when you say that the elephant wants to play the drums? No. Even though that is a human behavior as well, the elephant – showed with elephant body language that was excited and then reached out with the trunk and then grabbed the drum and then played the drum. It's not anthropomorphizing to say that like that yeah. animal wanted to do the thing. So I do think – I kind of like the term when you said zoopomorphizing or whatever yeah. you said because <laughs> I, I do think there is that interesting balance of like – we don't want to put human characteristics on animals, mm -hmm. but also humans are animals. Right. And we do have similar behaviors at times. And you can tell, especially if you're a keeper and especially if you know your animals, you can tell if an animal is happy. You can say that they want something. You can say that they're doing something. You know, I don't know. I, I think it's interesting that that certain behaviors people – shy away from talking about because it's anthropomorphism or, or certain phrases. Right. But then we'll also say, you know, red pandas like to take naps. But like they do. They snooze in the middle of the day. That's that's taking a nap. You know what I mean? Right. So right. I, I do actually think – I get what you're saying and I know that the, the zoological community right now, it, it tends to go in waves and there is a, a little opposition to anthropomorphizing. And I think you have to be careful with how much you do it. But I do also think that like nothing that you have said to me is like anthropomorphizing. You're not saying like – Oh, the little baby wants me to cuddle it. You're not that's that's anthropomorphizing or like, you know, something like that. Yeah. But you know, it is playing peekaboo. Even if that's not the name that it would use, <laughs> it's, it's baby's playing peekaboo, right? Like, right. you know, I don't know. Well, I think that the community wants to be scientific about it. Um, but also like and that's that's the part of me is that I want to build a connection with the guests that come. And I want them to be able to understand um the relationship that the animals have um, with their keepers and just by themselves in general. So it's it's really good to be able to build that connection. And to build a connection, you have to have something that the guests can understand and grasp onto. And so, yeah, no, the little baby or the little baby shouldn't, you know, wants to have you cuddled isn't the best way to build that connection with mm -hmm. the guest. But, um, you know, everybody knows what peekaboo is. So or at least most people do. If you don't, you know, definitely Google it. But um, <laughs> Be careful, though. Sometimes Google's sketchy. Um, <laughs> but, you know, building that connection with the guest is, is ultimately going to help the animals mm -hmm. in conservation in general. Yeah. I think as long as you are describing the actual behavior and the actual intention of the animal, I think it's yeah. okay to use some of that verbiage. Because yeah. you're right. If you were – like if you look at somebody you know, like a guest and you're like, so – my orangutan likes to do a behavior where it hides and then connects with you and then – they're, they're going to be like, just say it. Just say the friggin' word. It's peekaboo. I Googled it after I heard it on Ross Safari phrase. and it's fine. Yeah. And it's like you just don't have to be scientific about peekaboo. I, yeah. I don't know. This is, this is one of my soapbox things because as a person who is trying to approach impacting the world of conservation through storytelling – I do think that as long as the story that is told is accurate, it also has to be relatable and it has to be something that you can connect with. And, yeah. You know, we're not talking about a Loridae. We're talking about red pandas. Red pandas are a Loridae. That is their family. Right. But if I'm like, so tell me about your Loridae, then a bunch of people are going to be like, I don't know what the hell he's talking about right now and tune out. <laughs> but if I'm like, yo, tell me about your red pandas, then the pandas are going to be like, yes. The fandoms. You know? So like it's just – yeah, I don't know. Sorry. I got very soapboxy there. But this is something I'm passionate about yeah. because I – I'm learning so much more about the science of animals, but at the same time, I'm trying to stay super grounded and, you know, this is why we do these things, like to to try to connect to people mm -hmm. with the animals. And right. Yeah. So right. I will step off my soapbox now. <laughs> um, but yeah, is there anything else you want to tell me about the orangutan family before we move on? Um, I mean, I could talk to you about them for a really long time. So it's, it's really, you know, if you have any specific questions. Um, did you know there are three different types of orangutans? Yes, but I only recently learned that. So do you want to tell uh, my, my listeners? Sure, sure. So actually within – hopefully within your lifetime, if you're listening to this, you were probably born, you know. Um, yes, all of, my, all of my listeners have been born. You are correct. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, since 2011, so within our lifetimes, um, they did some research out in um, the Sumatra area and found that there were some skeletal remains. Um, so they went back and tested them in the lab and uh, found out that the DNA didn't match up to um, the Sumatran or the Bornean orangutan. So they had found, in fact, a new species. Um, and so they named it uh, the Tampanuli. Uh, which is from the Tampanili mountain range. Nice. So it's really interesting that within our lifetime, you know, we are still discovering the world around us. 
Absolutely, we are. And that doesn't even account for like the stuff in the ocean that we just have no, no clue. clue about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, there's a whole other world down there that we haven't even gotten to start destroying yet. So yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do I do sometimes wonder how many species we will discover that we destroyed without ever finding them, but like that we're yeah. here, at, you know, in humanity's lifetime, right. not talking dinosaurs, but we don't want to be a downer on the podcast. So let's talk it out of Lord. We're going to, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about some pandas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I am stupidly excited about the pandas that are here yeah. um, just because of my own little past. But so, so tell everybody about the, the pair that is here. So we have um, a male, Neo, which I think that you have a little bit of history with. Yes. Yeah. And anyone listening to the podcast, you should know that if you don't. Your punishment is you have to go back and listen to all the episodes to figure it out. Do it. <laughs> um, and then we also have um, our female, Asa. Yes. And do you do you know where they came from? So um, Neo came from uh, Erie mm-hmm. and then Asa came from Knoxville. Mm, okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, and She's a country star. Yes. <laughs> I like it. So, um, I mean, if you come from Knoxville, you're automatically a star because that's just, that's the panda place. So, yeah. you know, yeah. um, so yeah, tell me, tell me some characteristics. First of all, I'm noticing that there's a male and a female. So we do. do we have an SSP breeding rec? This is a recommendation Ooh. from the SSP for breeding. Yeah. Um, and we have seen that behavior, um, on exhibit. I actually saw that today when I was working with them. So, um, you know, Neo is still, you know, working with, uh, Miss Asa on that. Trying to say that as delicately. One way to phrase that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) But they have been recommended to breed and we have been seeing that behavior. So that's really exciting. Nice. I actually witnessed panda breeding for the first time recently, like myself. And um, they're very awkward. It is. And this is his first time um, with a female um, for breeding. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of still learning. I'm just going to let that sit right there. <laughs> I could ask follow-ups, but I'm not going to. I'm going to leave that to all of your imaginations. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but but learning enough to be successful, we think. I mean, obviously, we don't know if there's a baby yet, but, but yeah. successful copulation. Yes, that? yes. Okay. So um, I have some videos. Of course, this is you getting do. worse. No, so so what else should people be googling as they? <laughs> but you know, it's good for it's for science. It's for science. Um, but I actually took some videos, and in one of those videos, he looks to be successful. So um, I'm hopefully that uh, you know it will be you know what we see around you know July, um, maybe June. Um, but yeah, um, so far they they've been doing really good together. Um, when they first got into exhibit, they were not you know super excited about each other there was some swatting um there were some like little ball rolls of of (laughs) fluff and anger um (laughs) but they're they're doing a lot better um now and he actually um i bring um also our female in and that's because she will come up to the door um when i get to the exhibit and i don't you know want her to come into like i call it the foyer (laughs) Interior design but again. <laughs> there's like a little um, door that we have between, so we have two door entrances for our panda exhibit, and um, so she will come to the exhibit door, and I don't want her to come into the secondary containment. So I actually bring her into the den, and she's she gets rewarded for coming into the den, and she just kind of chills out there for you know a few minutes while I'm able to uh, service the exhibit. Sometimes Neo will come into. We have double dens, so she has a space, and then he has a space as well. Um, and sometimes Neo will come in, but sometimes he won't, and. It, Funnily enough, they are right across the way from our Siamang Gibbons, and our Siamang Gibbons uh, make a call, territorial call, every day. And so if um, the Gibbons are making a call, I notice that sometimes Neo will not come into the den, and he'll sometimes he'll hang out at the top of the exhibit. So I'm not sure if that is him being uncomfortable with that sound or not. Um, today they were calling, and he came down. So, But albeit, you know, we kind of let him choose if he wants to come in or not um but because of that behavior from asa she she mainly comes in the den each time um moving back reeling it back in uh today he was searching for her he got down on the ground and was moving around he was on the props he was you know on the top of the exhibits we have some beams and he was on the beams up there um i brought in bamboo for him to to nibble on um to sort of occupy him did not care wow did not care as soon as i you know i left the exhibit um, just to let him calm down a little bit. He was moving around quite a bit. And um, he actually came to the shift door and I let him in and he went in the den and just made some, it's very cute squeaks. They make some squeaks. They do. It's very it's cute. A, it's yeah. very adorable. And I was, I realized, I was like, I think he wants, you know, 
to see Asa. So I gave them access. They have a shift door between in the dens and I gave them access and he did. He followed her. Aww. So, and you know, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cute to see, but, um, that has definitely changed from when they first met each other <laughs> for sure. That's so cute. I love that. That's awesome. Um, are they, and I mean, individually, I'm not asking as a pair, but individually, are they, are they, very active for pandas. Are they very chill? Are they? Uh, I just I just came from seeing Ravi yesterday, the eight month old at Greensboro Science Center. Who oh is my goodness! The most active ah! panda I've ever seen. <laughs> I, it was ridiculous. <laughs> um, I mean, I was there for hours and he didn't stop moving. Yeah. So I know that no other pandas are like that. Yeah, but 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 where where, where where do these two sit on the um, activity spectrum? So I have one of each. Um, uh, Asa is very active, and then Neo's uh, he's the chill dude. Okay, he's a, he's a lot more calm. Um, they will both. I mean, it is it is a crepuscular animal, which your audience may or may not know about that. Just say it in case they don't. But yeah, we've we've talked okay. about it before. This is the word that I have the hardest time saying on the podcast. Ooh. So, but but yeah, I always have new listeners. So yeah. so go ahead and drop yeah. in. Drop some knowledge. Um, so crepuscular means that they're awake during dawn and dusk. So they're going to be more, most active. Now, they, they will still be awake um, during the daytime, um, and they may even come down to take a little snack break. Um, but we're going to see the most activity during the dawn and the dusk. So um, because of that, um, I will see more behavior from both Neo and Asa um, in the morning and in the evening time as well. But whereas Asa can have a lot more activity during the daytime hours, Neo's most likely going to be in the top beam taking a, a good old nappy poo. Nice. Nice. Very cool. Um, do you, what do you, in your experience, do you have any theories on is just how active they are natural or, you know, does it change if they're hand reared or not or any of that kind of stuff? So I think it depends on the individuals. Um, Neo was hand reared. So I think that that might make, you know, some sort of difference in it. Um, I have not had the experience of hand rearing pandas, so I can't say for certain that it works with every hand reared panda um but i do know that that sometimes can make a difference in, in behavioral changes makes sense and what kind of enrichment do you give the pandas so we give them a variety of enrichment as well kind of like our orangutans so sometimes we'll do scent based enrichment There's a lot of times we'll do like um prop based or like items um sometimes we can do like hide and seek kind of stuff um they definitely will get like uh, asa's big fan of bananas so um i'll put bananas on a ball sometimes and put it on the ground which is not a normal place but enrichment doesn't necessarily have to be a overly positive experience either it's just something that changes their natural behavior, um, allows them to um, facilitate that natural behavior. So behavior that a red penis can have is coming down to the ground sometimes. And so to find something that they might, you know, want to munch on or explore. And that gives her that opportunity um, with the banana on a ball. Um, we give them um, sometimes stuff that you wouldn't necessarily expect, like ice cube trays. Nice. Um, so they have to sort of dig in that little hole to be able to grab that item, whether it be like a little raisin, a craisin, or maybe some applesauce. Um, then also, you know, we give them slow feeders sometimes too. So um, things that you would expect and sometimes things that you wouldn't expect. That's very cool. Are the pandas here very food motivated? Yes. Mm. That came quick. That, that, was, that was very fast yeah. answer. Was, but was, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. I definitely see a lot of changes um, when I bring out, you know, goodies. Nice. So whether now also more so than Neo, just okay. because of the behavior. Mm -hmm. um, she's more in, engaging sometimes um, than Neo can't. Then he's not necessarily not engaging, um, but sometimes depending on what day I'm training or like what time of the day I'm training, um, that can all factor into it. Uh, we are working on ultrasound training with Asa oh, right nice. now. That, that makes so. sense since, since Neo is learning this skill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she's done really well. And that's one of the things that I can always count on is as her, she will come down for some snackies, nice. um, on her ultrasound bar. Very, very cool. I'm, uh, I'm excited that they are here. I'm excited for eventual hopeful panda cub. Me too. And I'm excited to come back and see said panda cub. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll be in touch. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's very, uh, Ugh, I just love pandas. They're just so good. <laughs> so did you love pandas before you started working with them? Or Who doesn't? is that what made I mean that's fair. If that, you don't, then fair. you should like them right now. <laughs> Immediately. No questions asked. <laughs> I like it. That's that's how we're gonna do conservation messaging from now on. We're just gonna bully people. It's gonna be like, listen to me, you like red pandas, redpandanetwork.org. Shut up. Do it. <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah. So, okay. So we are, we're doing pretty good on time here. Um, give me a quick run through of, of the rest of your animals. 
So um, we still have our Amr Leopards and we still have our Siamine Gibbons. Yeah. Well, we obviously have to talk about both. So uh, <laughs> pick pick your poison. My poison? Um, uh, let's do the Amr Leopards. Great. So tell me about the Amr Leopards. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have two that are here. Um, Amr Leopards are the rarest cat on the planet. Yes. Um, so conservation is very, very important um, if we're going to keep these species alive for longevity. And um, the... Two that we have are mother and son. We have female Jade, who came from Potawatomi. Um, and um, she was brought here on pretty rec- recommendation with a cat from um, Germany, which is really, really cool. For nice. Different, different kind of bringing in bloodlines from different areas. Um, so that was really important for the SSP and for the breeding of the you know, leopards in general. But So was the leopard brought here from Germany or was it just like a – like sperm sample was brought here and it was AI No, he was brought oh, here. Oh, okay. Wow. He that's... was brought here. That I bet there was some uh, some paperwork involved there. There Goodness. was probably a lot of paperwork. Yeah, involved. Yeah. I wasn't there for that process, Ooh. but I can only imagine because just I've, I've transferred a leopard um, across the states, and just to have that paperwork was a lot. I so I can't imagine, you know, where well, I can't imagine, but it, it's a lot. Anyhow, um, yeah. So Nelkin was um, here, and he was part of that breeding recommendation from the SSP uh, for Amar leopards, and um, he did his job. He did it well, and he is now at Philadelphia Zoo. So, nice. Yeah. All right. I, I am sowing his oats. I'm I'm Philly based, so oh, I have cool. I have seen him then. So. Ah, yes, yeah. that's wonderful. Yay! Yeah. That's he's awesome. a beautiful. He's a he's a big boy, but he's a beautiful cat. Nice. Yeah. So, um, Jade had two cubs on February 10th, um, 2019, and the two that she had, she had a female and a male. Um, Anastasia uh, was our female, and she, ironically enough, is at Potawatomi Zoo, where her mother uh, was. So nice. it's a great transition. He's a full circle kind of thing. Um, and then our male is um, he's still here, the uh, son. Jasper has been here since he was born. And we do have two exhibits that they kind of work with together. So they're not never together. One, they'd come together to breed or to fight. We're not trying to have either of those happen. Right, right. Um, but um, we have a larger exhibit and a smaller exhibit. So our um, cat, one cat will be in a larger exhibit and we shift different times. So it's not necessarily per day, um, but it could be, you know, for a few hours during the day, it could be, we shift them, you know, once it could be that we shift them a couple times during the day. Um, it could be that they get in that enclosure for maybe a day and a half kind of thing. We want to vary it on that schedule. Um, but allowing them to have different enclosures and different experiences was, is good for them. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. D- does it ever like seem kind of crazy that you're at like this small zoo and like you have all these insanely awesome endangered animals that you're you're taking care of, like red pandas and the rarest cat in the world and all that stuff? Um, sometimes it's kind of dreamy, you know, for me. Just I try not to lose sight of that either. But um, sometimes I'll, you know, watching the animals and we don't as keepers, we're on the go constantly. Like I don't have a lot of time to observe. Um so sometimes we'll even push that information to like um, people that are doing research or allow, you know, people that are doing you know different internships. It's like if they want to do some observations, we encourage that because it allows us the opportunity to keep moving, keep grooving. And they can still um, do the observations that they need to for either schoolwork or paperwork or allow that information to come back to us as well if we are able to do studies and whatnot. But um, it's it's wonderful when I do get the chance to, to spend time watching them. Um, and that's when that dreamy moment comes back for me. It's like, oh, my gosh, this is this is incredible. Like I'm watching the rarest cat on the planet right now. Like, how did I get here? I was, you know, picking out cabinets you know, <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> here I am looking at, you know, an incredible animal. So, um, yeah, so that, yeah, that would say yes to that. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. And then last but not least, we're going to talk about Simings. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we have a, um, family group and they, um, are Oscar, our male, Ella, our female, um, we have a baby named Luke, and then we have um, a sub-adult named AJ. And um, our sub-adult and our male are kind of a having a hard time right now. Um, so imagine it like your 19-year-old son with his Ferrari um, has... <laughs> you know, I have an eight-year-old son, and I feel like you're setting him up for expectations that I'm not going to be able to meet in about 11 years. I don't and know. This podcast is going to take off, oh, manifesting it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so he's going to have to have a Ferrari. I would go with <laughs> obviously, yellow. Obviously, yeah. Just for funsy-wonsies. But, 
gosh. Um, but yeah, so there, you know, imagine your 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 eight year old son's nineteen and he has his uh, Ferrari, and um, he's been partying at the house and he's been gallivanting off, you know, just not really having. He doesn't have a job yet. Like he's just, you know, kind of just enjoying this a little bit longer than he should. You know, he needs to get out, um, start his own life, start his family. And you're saying, yeah, you know, you got to go. And, um, you know, he doesn't, he's not doing that. So that's kind of what we're seeing right now gotcha. with our Simon Gibbons, um, is that, you know, Oscar and AJ are at the point now where he would say, Hey, you need to start your own family. You need to get out of here. Um, so at some point or another, he will have that opportunity. That's going to be through our SSP as well. Right. So they'll say, you know, Hey, we have a placement for him. Um, but as of right now, we're sort of just maintaining those behaviors and making sure that they're as cognitively enriched, um, as well as, um, just their welfare as well for, for the time being. Very cool. And, um, you know, I know that Gibbons in general are really into song and you mentioned that a little bit when we were talking yeah. um, about Red Pandas, but um, what, you know, are the tunes good? Do they sing a lot here? Is it, uh, <laughs> I, I actually, I, I uh, did an interview with uh, Gabby Scalar of the uh, Gibbon Conservation Foundation wow, and um, yeah, it was very cool. It was out in California at her facility with, all, and she was explaining to me that like Gibbon song is like, music theory like they sing they have certain parts they harm yeah. like mm-hmm. so do you, do you see a lot of that here do you get to hear that do you catch as a musician that blows my mind like i want to jam with gibbons someday they, <laughs> 10 o'clock be here <laughs> <laughs> they do typically start up when we they start seeing other people that is a territorial call it's just mm-hmm. kind of letting everybody else know this is their home for the day um and they can do that more than once a day um but ours will typically just do their their song once a day um but that particular you know she's right they do have different parts that they play in that um they're not really doing that stuff at the same time they're doing it you know offbeat to each other um and each one of them has a role in that and so um typically our male oscar starts it um but ella and um aj will follow suit so it's it's really amazing to hear um and yeah i I think it definitely is it's a very loud call it can be heard from um almost everywhere in the zoo so it's definitely good for people to hear that and people to have the opportunity to come up and see that and, and In real life, in real time. Yeah, that's awesome. Very cool. Uh, Are there any conservation organizations you'd like to give a shout out to? Definitely the Red Panda Network. I mean, I'm sure your listeners know. Yeah, I I volunteer (laughs) for them. So, yeah. Yeah, you really? Oh, yeah. yeah, That's incredible. I love that. Yeah. Do you guys do um, anything for International Red Panda Day? At the zoo? Um, yes, we do. Awesome. We do. Cool. Yeah. I will be uh, coordinating that with you this year. So oh. I'll be one of the people contacting you. So. Perfect. Yeah. I love that. Yay. I'd also like to recommend the Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program okay. as well. That's something that we have um, donated in the past to and something that I would love to, to for listeners to hear about and research on their own. Nice. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. It's time now, don't you know? We've come to the end of the show. But there's one tale left to go You're gonna laugh and say, oh no It's time for the Rossifari Poop Story So I definitely um, have a, as a poop story Poop story Is that what we're going for? Oh, yeah. yeah And it's about red pandas Woo. So um, I feel like <laughs> I've pulled the listeners along this far So they'll enjoy this part too <laughs> Um we have um, some litter boxes that we use for our red pandas, um, and we have some substrate that we use in that as well. Now, some of our um, litter boxes that we have have holes in them. So like when it drains, the rain comes, um, that it will just drain right through it. A couple of them don't. Um, and this has happened on a day that I didn't think that I was expecting rain, but I definitely put one out there. And um, yeah, so it rained. We didn't have a cover. We have covers over them now, um, but we didn't have a cover at the time. And um, this is the reason why we have the covers. Um, (laughs) And I think they were me or my backup that were, we were in there the next day. It might've been us both, but um, the, (laughs) we go in to clean (laughs) clean the exhibit and um you know because red pandas poop in a lot of different places yes you know want to make sure that they mark their their territory and their their um their enclosure as well in this particular case but um they will use the substrate for the litters and the litter boxes as as part of that well we go in to clean up the exhibit and then we get to the poop box and um the the box is just i mean it's poop soup (laughs) 
<laughs> it is poop soup. I mean, it is covered. The rain, I mean, it's like torrential downpours. And there's just poop. And it is some of it's floating. Some of it's down on the ground. I mean, it's brown. And it was, of course, the one that didn't have the hole in it and didn't have a cover. And it was just like we're trying to pick up this poop soup. <laughs> <laughs> in the litter box and it's just I mean it's heavy and there's a long way and so you have to go from the exhibit you have to go through the foyer um, <laughs> and then down the pathway to be able to get rid of it and we don't really have like a great drainage back there so we just put it in a trash bag <laughs> oh, no. So, I mean, I didn't want to put it in the den <laughs> and then put it through that drain. So I just put it in a trash can, double trashed it, and just poop soup was gone. <laughs> nice. We learned a lot. I learned a lot. So, and now we have different covers over, and all of them have holes in them now. So it was a great learning experience. You live, you learn. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for, for having me on. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't that awesome? That was so much fun. And then it became even more fun. Uh, This was one of those episodes where I knew I was going to be talking to a panda keeper and I didn't really know much else. Uh, As y'all may remember from last week, Maxine, uh, my guest from then and the person who set all of this up, and I are friends. And so it was a little more casual than some of the things that I do. And um, so I was very excited that after we said our goodbyes there and I hit save and everything, uh, Maxine was like, cool, should we go hang out with the pandas? Can we, can we go feed the pandas? And so we, we went and we fed the pandas. And I got to tell y'all, it was really interesting seeing the personalities that were discussed in this episode come out so clearly. It's another great example about how keepers like Melody really know the animals that they take care of. And it was, it was just really magical to get to spend some more time uh, with some red pandas, which I will post some pictures of uh, that time on the Insta today, if you're listening to this on the day that it came out. So yeah, yay, red pandas. And, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to um, to Melody and to Maxine and really everyone who uh, opened up their hearts and their time to me at the Greenville Zoo. It was a really, really great time being there. And I'm so excited to be sharing that amazing, small but mighty facility with y'all. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll see you back here on Friday for for Zoo News. And remember, friends, the word credits backwards is Steider. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.